Excellent. It's working. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So I'll only take it live at um, six. We won't have to do anything to the. No, halas, you're done. You can just leave it as it is. The link is correct. Yeah. So now I'm going to make you host. Yes. One question is that if when we're doing the videos, uh, how can you get the videos to play on? I'll only take it live. Uh, Actually, uh, so sorry, Sonali, can you pause the going the live? No, Halas, you're done. You can just leave it as it is. The um, link. Excellent. I can see that we are live. Real. Um, hi, welcome everyone that's here with us today. Um, welcome everyone that will join us in the future through the recording. I'm Maisel Bake. I'm the Programs and Community Initiative Manager at Warehouse 421. Um, and today we are uh, at incredibly the seventh uh, public talk that's part of our curatorial development colloquium that is in partnership with the incredible uh, Bombay Institute for Critical Analysis and Research, Bikar. Um, and I think it's kind of crazy that we are at the seventh. This is, this is the penultimate one. Um, and I won't spend a lot of time talking about our speaker today, um, uh, but I do want to take uh, a moment to thank Bikar for the incredible collegiality and partnership we've had on this project. And of course, our colloquium participants have really animated this space for us with uh, all of your commitment and rigor. Um, today, we will hear from Pallavi, uh, Pallavi Paul, um, an artist and a film scholar with a practice that interrogates how, quote unquote, truth is produced and argued in public life. Um, Munal Jadir, one of our, collo our colloquium participants, will be introducing her and moderating the discussion following Pallavi's talk. So without further ado, off to you, Muna and then Pallavi. Okay. Hi, everyone. and Welcome and thank you for joining us. Uh, we're lucky enough to be joined today by Pallavi Paul, who is an artist and film scholar. Uh, her practice interrogates how truth is produced and argued in public life, paying it mind to the tension between documents and their aesthetic utterance that gets repressed in contemporary productions of the documentary. She is one half of Splice, a curatorial and artistic practice co-founded with Rohini Tafasha. So without further ado, um, Pallavi, go ahead. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I must, of course, uh, begin by thanking a Warehouse 421 and Bigar for this uh, warm and generous uh, invitation. Everyone uh, working in these wonderful institutions, including Rohit, Mace, Shama, Kunal, Sonali, all of whom I've been in touch with. I also thank all colloquium participants and my respondent for today's session, Mona. Um, even as uh, all of us are feeling a sense of uh, enervation or fatigue emerging from this kind of live screen based uh, sociality, these modes of gathering um, still somehow uh, persistently uh, push us to think, to debate, conjecture, um, and listen with one another. Uh, and for this, uh, big congratulations to this entire group uh, for keeping at it. Okay, uh, to now jump right into the talk, um, because I have been uh, asked to specifically uh, focus on my film practice, uh, maybe um, it's useful to arrive at my at my work uh, and the and the ways in which it it confronts, um, departs, and convenes uh, with the prompts of this colloquium um, is to is to start by opening out uh, the material processes of image production and the various kinds of uh, philosophical um, impulses undergirding them. Uh, you know, to annotate our coexistence uh, with images. Uh, you know, we are either always conjuring, erasing, um, reformulating, passing through, moving alongside images. Uh, and, you know, uh, we're all over them and they're all over us. Uh, so the first uh, foundational thing to point to is that my method um, to kind of navigate uh, this thick world of images is to always try and produce a transmission uh, between the particular and the universal, right? Um, to me, one without the other 
is not only uh, disinteresting, uh, you know, inert, uh, myopic, uh, but also I think actively hinders um, the ability to kind of apprehend um, the latent potencies, you know, which uh, invigorate uh, politics, creativity, um, and, and life itself. Um, so I will try and assemble my thoughts today um, in a kind of a purposefully uh, chaotic uh, and kind of non-chronological fashion, uh, almost like assembling uh, an edit timeline uh, with many simultaneous uh, sequences and bins going together. So for the first section, uh, I will start with photography move to a time before the advent of photography and then jump ahead um, into my practice. Um, and the idea is to very gently turn the question of what um, is the photographic image? How is it formed? Um, and here I also want to simultaneously kind of plot the themes of catastrophe, future, time and history uh, that the speakers in this colloquium before me have invoked in various fascinating ways, uh, you know, through uh, these past weeks. Uh, and I want to see all of this then alongside the technological time of image formation and the ways in which the materiality of light itself is mediated. Okay, uh, so, uh, so most simply in, in celluloid photography, for example, uh, light is guided uh, by a photographic equipment, uh, which is uh, most commonly a camera. Uh, onto a material surface uh, that is coated with a photosensitive chemical, you know, for example, silver nitrate, right? Uh, this chemical is uh, capable of capturing or fixing this light. Um, the parts that the light can access on this kind of photosensitive surface or the, or the parts on which it falls directly are actually digested by light, right? And in turn, they pr it produces different degrees of darkness, which correspond to the intensity of light, which means that the brighter and the more intense uh, the light that we have, the deeper are always the blacks in our image, right? The parts of the cellulose plate or surface that are partially kept from the light or are shielded from it actually give us the image that we finally see, right? In digital photography, of course, you know, the, the material surface uh, of cellulose has been replaced by sensors and, and these photosensitive molecules with pixels, but essentially the principle is the same, right? What is visible to light is combusted and that which the light cannot see or digest is what we see and gives us the image that we kind of receive as audiences, right? So if we had to kind of conceptually render this entire technological process, maybe it will suffice to say that photographs are actually inverted or negative imprints of the world around us. And what produces this inversion or negation is actually a contest between the vision of light as it were, and our vision, you know, as, as uh, subjects in the world implicated within various kinds of structures of society, of power, justice, etc. And often, you know, in representation-led discourses, um, you know, so the, so, the, so the little text, for example, that I wrote as a primer to this talk, uh, which is on the discussion document, uh, talks about the tension between representation, that's a positivistic capture of the world, and countenancing the world, which is kind of a way to observe the transference or transmission between history, sensation, image, and so on, right? Um, so anyway, so representation and all of the anxieties that accompany it actually reify um, uh, the indexical power of images and, and uh, collapse these two um, orders of vision, right? Uh, which is the vision of light itself and the vision of the historically produced human subject, right? So my first claim tonight, I'm gonna make three claims. My first claim tonight is to make a case for us uh, to carefully disentangle these two kinds of vision, right? By taking the material process of image making seriously uh, on its own terms, right? Okay, so how do we do this? All right, now, now this idea of what an image 
must or can accomplish has actually morphed in very interesting ways, you know, through the 18th to the 21st centuries, uh, especially uh, after the arrival of mechanized image making. Um, and many of you uh, may be familiar with the vast kind of body of uh, philosophical work from Europe uh, in the 20th century that deals with these questions extensively. Uh, but today, instead of invoking those arguments, I actually want to invoke some specific images where the changing status of light and shadow produces a certain kind of um, argumentative aesthetic paradigm, right? Uh, which kind of implicates uh, in turn ideas of objectivity, of, uh, of truth, of, of error, uh, imagination, uh, and so on. Uh, and these images that I want to want to run by you are also from the history of science, uh, where the claim of truthful observation of the world has to be laid uh, most strongly, uh, right? So if I can request uh, 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 Sonali to kindly share the, uh, this, the first slide, please, Sonali. And, um, yep. And then talk alongside it. Yeah, thank you. Right. So this image that you see, uh, this is William Cheseldon, uh, the guy who's looking through the camera obscura. Now he's sort of, uh, you know, as a, as a kind of a founding uh, figure of modern surgery, right? Uh, he was also the first person to have used uh, the camera obscura uh, through which uh, he gained kind of precision uh, in his illustrations of the human skeletal system. So osteographia, which is the name of the treatise, uh, in, in Cheseldon's, uh, Cheseldon's own words, uh, it, it aimed to provide the most accurate study of the human skeleton to date, uh, and also to create the most attractive atlas of osteology available, right? Now, if you see this image, uh, Cheseldon is looking uh, through the camera obscura while his apprentice uh, holds a skeleton upside down, right? This is for Cheseldon to see it the right way up because of how, cam how the camera obscura works. But these photographs that were literally generated by turning things askew uh, were the basis of naturalistic sketches of the human form, right? So the two quick things to take from this is uh, this image is that the pre-image of the hand-drawn image, right? which continues to be fetishized widely in, in art writing, in art, in curatorial discourse, even today, the pre-image of that hand-drawn image is actually a mechanical image, right? And this mechanical image requires that the world be rearranged almost radically, right? Made its own inverse. So that's the first image. Uh, the second image now, Sonali, if we could jump to the second one, yes. Now, the second image is Goethe's of Flanza, which is um, the ideal uh, plant form, right? Um, not plants that actually exist in nature, but how a plant ought to be or can be, right? A plant that's always becoming its own ideal. Um, so a clover, for example, not as it would be found in the wild, but maybe a bit wilted, a bit moth-eaten, slightly out of perfect proportions, right? but as it can be, right, without all of the errors that actually nature introduces uh, into it. The third image uh, is by Albinus and Wandelaar, uh, and Albinus is of course responsible for the foreground uh, uh, and the skeleton that's kind of beautifully illustrated and, and kind of made to pose in this dancerly fashion. And Wandelaar brings an exotic background to the beauty of the foreground. Of course, notice the rhino at the time, a recent arrival into Europe from the colonies, so also has a novelty value. Now, in, all, in these three images, you know, in all of these cases, the image is an improvement upon the world as it exists, right? So the lack or the void of the world is compensated by the beauty and the perfection of the image. And this completes the circuit of experience, uh, which transcends the experience of say the individual to the experience of humanity, right? This produces this kind of universal aesthetic, right? Now, uh, the maker of the image then was just a bit short of God, right? A sage or a, or a peer who could control this kind of beauty. And so long as this was possible, that light could be used uh, solely in the service of beauty and perfection, catastrophe could be kept at bay because even cadavers and corpses are beautiful, right? But this begins to change with the advent of this fourth kind of image, 
the next image, uh, which is an image by Otto Funk, which is kind of this, again, an illustration made from a microscopic view of blood. Uh, now, microscopes, as we know, of course, are optical, mechanical devices that use lenses, just like cameras. Um, but unlike bone, uh, that is kind of static and holds its form and is kind of devoid of color, blood is pigmented, it's viscous, it's moving, uh, and it provokes a mechanical vision in a new way. Um, so, you know, chromatic aberration, so the red begins to look a bit brown or yellow as soon as blood comes into contact with air, or its constituent crystals look a bit bent depending on whether it was imaged when it was still a bit wet or dry. All of this became a part of the illustrations made by Funk. But instead of discrediting the image, as would have happened in the previous instances of these images that you saw, it was the error or the mistake that is a departure from the ideal that gives this kind of image its value, right? So now this becomes proof of the fidelity between uh, the process of life and that of image making. So now the image maker moves from being say a sage to an extension of the mechanical eye, right? The interpreter of the world as it were. And the eye of this create, uh, um, image creator is now not just interpreting the image, but also the lag or the gap that exists between any phenomena and its image. And finally, uh, the fourth image, uh, I want us to think of uh, something like the LIGO experiment. Now LIGO uh, is, uh, stands for Laser Inferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. Um, yeah, so it's the world's largest gravitational wave observatory, basically, right? Now LIGO works um, by analyzing uh, properties of uh, light and space itself to detect uh, or understand the origins of gravitational waves that basically under undergird uh, everything. Right? But what distinguishes LIGO from a stereotypical astronomical observatory is that LIGO is actually blind. Right, LIGO, the observatory is blind because it's not, it doesn't point to any particular part of the sky. Uh, unlike, you know, kind of optical or radio telescopes, LIGO doesn't see electromagnetic radiation. Uh, so for example, vis visible light or radio waves or microwaves, because it doesn't have to. Uh, gravitational waves are not part of this kind of electromagnetic spectrum. They're a completely different phenomena, right? So by the time we come to today, and this was uh, the LIGO observatories were first set up in 2002, evidence of phenomena in science begin to also, we can see that it's beginning to get unhinged from its image, right? LIGO produces no image, but it can tell us what's going on in the gravitational realm of the earth precisely because it is blind, right? And I will invoke uh, blindness again a little later with respect to one of my works. But for now, I want you to remember that within this domain of science and truth, uh, the truthful image, we have come from the ideal image to the error image to no image. Right? What I'm trying to do by, by plotting this is to actually urge for us to move away from a reliance on images as, as repositories of any kind of positive value or content driven images, you know, this is a phrase we hear quite a lot, uh, or as log books that can successfully kind of record uh, complex exchanges and transmissions that compose our shared world to think of the image as an inverted imprint of the world, right? And to think of it like that is to think of it as a void, right? but not as a positive void, for example, like not as a black hole that's kind of packed with invisible matter, but as the heart of the heart, which is also the title of my talk today. Uh, and the heart of the heart is a space that signals a kind of truly radical emptiness, uh, which is a generative emptiness, actually, a provocation to the foundations of knowledge. Uh, so, you know, this term, the heart of the heart, I know it sounds almost like wet and lyrical, but it's actually a mathematical thesis uh, proposed by Alexander Rothendieck, uh, and some of you may, may know of him, and, uh, you know, for those who don't, he was kind of one of the most interesting, provocative, logical minds of the 20th century. Uh, uh, you know, he was a Jewish uh, dissident, a political mathematician who was deeply interested in uh, theology, in metaphysics. Uh, you know, he very seriously engaged with uh, with Buddhism, with Christianity. 
rejected uh, capitalist forms of sociality. Uh, you know, he mobilized various kinds of student movements and movements in the larger intellectual community against hegemonic wars like the one in Vietnam, etc. He taught for many, many years at the University of Montpellier until he completely extricated himself uh, from the discipline of mathematics. Now, in many ways, this was a major event uh, in, uh, in the history of this discipline because uh, Grothendieck was vi widely acknowledged as kind of the, the founder of uh, modern algebraic geometry, which is very, as you know, very closely allied to logic and to rational thought. Now, in one of the architects of a discipline actually turn against it or, or dismantle it, it always opens up, you know, very exciting uh, possibilities of recalibrating uh, the imaginations that kind of undergird knowledge production. Uh, and this concept, the heart of the heart, was central to the breakup between the discipline of mathematics and Grothendieck. Because in proposing um, an abstract mathematical space, he exposed the kind of limit uh, that is encoded within um, logic, which is unable to fully apprehend uh, negativity, right? And he describes the heart of the heart, and I quote, uh, as a ray of light capable of illuminating every conceivable incarnation of a mathematical object, however, in itself profoundly empty, evacuated entirely of any object, unquote, right? So, so now what's clear from this example is that any uh, acknowledgement of negativity or, or radical emptiness almost always produces a profound rupture in knowledge. Uh, but this rupture is teeming uh, with imagination, with creativity, with possibilities. And this break is not an arresting of thought, but it's actually a creative and a political destruction of some forms of thought. Um, so if I put it in terms of this colloquium, uh, you know, it can be kind of a, a release uh, from the oppressive uh, telos of history while retaining an imagination of a future uh, that is not overdetermined by already spent and fatigued uh, systems of, of knowledge production. So it, it, it uh, kind of in a way instantiates a, a dismantling uh, or, or a toppling for new things to happen. And, and in terms of, uh, you know, and if we transpose this onto the uh, term future perfect, uh, you know, this perfection of the future, it's not an event, it's not even a grammatical condition, but it's actually a political attitude. Uh, that doesn't depend on a relativist or pacifist terms of the historical present, right? Rather that which is uh, yet to come, yet to be uh, visible, yet to be uttered as a co-architect of this, of this attitude, right? Uh, so, so the bare and the kind of blinding vision of light on the one side that we started from, and the textured and reflexive vision of political actants like ourselves, must work together as kind of a centripetal and a centrifugal force at once, uh, where, where the outside becomes the inside and inverts darkness and light, and with it, the entire world, as it were, right? And, and we ought to kind of create from this uh, heart of the heart, because uh, any lesser imagination for artistic work, for curatorial intelligence, for exhibition making, for art writing and thinking, uh, would be like shortchanging uh, ourselves. So in line with this first claim, uh, I want to present a bit of the of a 2014 film uh, that I did, which is called Nai Kheti, uh, or translates in English as New Harvest. Now the premise uh, for this film uh, was a book that I had encountered in uh, 2013 by a poet called Jack Spicer, and the book is called After Lorca. Now, this book is fascinating because uh, Jack Spicer is writing to Garcia Lorca nearly 20 years after his death, right? And the writing is not in the vein of a memorialization, but it's urgent questions, queries, uh, disagreements, affections, etc. Uh, so my very first impulse in the work was to try and find a way for Lorca uh, to write uh, back to Spicer. Right? However, for this maneuver against history to be successful, I needed an ally, a conduit, and, and, and that I found in Vidrohi, uh, a revolutionary poet from JNU. 
Um, and uh, when I was making the film, uh, both Spicer and Lorca were dead. Uh, so it was like a double rejection of death, uh, you know, as, uh, as the end of political imagination. Uh, but now uh, with Vidrohi also having passed on, the film has become about now, for me now the film is about the dead continuing to uh, weave a mutiny and a rebellion in our myths uh, against the constrictive uh, diktats of uh, national boundaries or prescribed epochs. Uh, you know, they have in some ways become um, the, the extra corporeal uh, kind of energetic architects of, of the future perfect uh, that we are trying to assemble in this colloquium. Uh, so maybe I can ask, uh, request Sonali to please share the uh, clip from Naikheti. <laughs> Jagir mangata, ku jagir mangata, jani jani amana ya jagir manga. Ikala juga. Mai kisan hu asman me dhan bora. Jani jani ama ya jagir manga. कुछ लोग कह रहे हैं कि पगले आसमान में धान नहीं जमा करता मैं कहता हूँ कि गिगले गुगले अगर जमीन पर भगवान जम सकता है तो आसमान में धान भी जम सकता है और अब तो दोनों में एक होकर रहेगा या तो जमीन से भगवान उखड़ेगा या तो आसमान में धान जमेगा पूरा माल मांगता मालिकाना मांगता बाबू आम से पूछा तो ठाकुराना मांगता दूध दाई ये केवा ये कब क्या रही
Okay, uh, now my second claim uh, tonight is um, about the relationship of the catastrophe to the archive, which is especially significant uh, when it comes to film and other durational forms. Uh, now the most simple question to start with, uh, but I also think important uh, because this is a group of curators and writers whose primary task is to produce uh, new forms of attention around works. Um, so is it the destruction of the archive that is the catastrophe? Or is it the formation of the archive with its performance of a trans-historical relevance uh, that is the catastrophic condition? What happens to the idea of attention in the face of a catastrophe? Uh, can we imagine uh, the durational velocity of cinema uh, as rending uh, the archive? Uh, and to use a phrase I've used earlier, creatively destroy uh, the archive in order to produce new forms of uh, recursivity and reflection. An example that I um, an example that I like to use very much, uh, almost as a test case uh, for all these uh, questions, is uh, Chris Marker's apocalyptic film La Jetty, uh, which is set uh, in this catastrophic world of a post nuclear disaster Paris, right? Uh, and the film describes, uh, you know, the time of, uh, of meeting of two lovers, uh, you know, the scenario in the film. And it says, uh, time builds itself painlessly around them. Now, this time, uh, the time in which they meet is painless because they have been momentarily ejected from history. Right? Uh, in fact, if taken to its uh, logical conclusion, uh, love is uh, possible in the post-apocalyptic world of La Jete, uh, because there is no fear of impending death, uh, because mortality is no longer uh, you know, an event, it is a kind of a condition and an orientation towards which all the protagonists of the film have already been enlisted. So what they recall then are not hist uh, simply historical memories, right? They meet as if they were meeting anew each time. And so the entire kind of painful burden of telos in history has etherized uh, for them to convene freely and time can build painlessly, uh, you know, um, around them. Uh, again, another kind of uh, future perfect, right? And what makes this vibrate even more vigorously is that the entire film is, is composed of stills, right? Um, and, the, and the only time movement comes in is to actually tell us that stillness and movement are not opposites uh, and that life and death are not events, but actually conditions of time 
right? Uh, and also as a uh, kind of lateral annotation to this is uh, that Bernard Stiegler, uh, in his discussion of the, of the organology uh, of the mind, he argues that reason is a form of attention, right? Um, and by suggesting that reason, uh, like attention, can be discontinuous, malleable, it can be captured, it can be reversed, uh, Stiegler takes us squarely into the domain of uh, politics. Um, and, and he further builds on this idea uh, by saying that actually knowledge is, a, is an arrangement that's made up of a retention, that is memory, and protension, uh, that is expectations, right? Um, and these are mediatized. Uh, and uh, those of you who are familiar with uh, Stiegler's work also know that he's uh, specifically interested in the digital. And he says that each coordinate, each of the coordinates of knowledge, right, uh, are always in uh, motion internally and externally. So within them, on their own axis, as it were, and also in relationship to one another. So now, if we had to imagine the archive as a pull between protension, that is expectation, and retention, that is memory, then in my work, I try to actually incise the very image around which this pull is happening to kind of throw the whole archival arrangement of kilter. And sometimes, uh, you know, this, uh, this incision is uh, literal uh, and at other times, uh, it, you know, it's more conceptual. Uh, and for me, each kind has its own uh, contextual uh, competence, right? Uh, so here, uh, you know, in line with this claim, I want to share with you a sequence from my uh, new uh, film, The Blind Rabbit, uh, which is uh, in many ways about many political um, uh, episodes, uh, you know, uh, from the history of India, uh, including uh, the national emergency, uh, the program uh, against uh, Muslims in Northeast Delhi, uh, the attack on students in Jamia and JNU uh, during the anti-CAA protest, uh, where state-backed violence happened, then fake archives were conjured around those acts, and then even those were destroyed in order to kind of achieve the appearance of a smooth uh, re-democratization, uh, as it were, right? Um, so this section, I guess, can be summarized uh, in a phrase uh, from the film where I say that sometimes a doubling can be a cutting into half, right? Um, and here I also want to invoke my very dear friend and longtime interlocutor, uh, uh, film historian, philosopher, Kaushik Bhomik, who actually made this very enlightening observation about catastrophe in a, in a conversation that we were having a few days ago, where he said that things are catastrophic when no exchange, real or symbolical, uh, symbolic is, is any, long, any longer possible, right? Uh, now, this kind of seizing of exchange uh, while producing uh, almost a kind of painful singularity can also be channeled to confront uh, commodity culture, uh, the fren frenzied circulation of objects and people in capitalism. And in case of this particular sequence that, uh, you know, I just want, I want to share with you now, um, uh, you know, one could uh, say that a kind of a symbolic corporeal exchange uh, between um, an oppressive leader and her body double is ventured, but it can never be fully complete because blindness in some ways is a, is a co-journeyer of catastrophe, right? In its very structure, uh, a catastrophe cannot be witnessed or photographed or imaged. Uh, and in a way, this is also the foundational provocation of cinema, right, uh, to catastrophe. So um, I uh, now would request the first, uh, and the, the next clip to be uh, played, the first one from the Blind Rabbit, uh, Sonali, if you could please. फोर में हुआ था और जब हम लोग इंदिरा गांधी बन के गए थे तो वो कौन सा था जब इंदिरा गांधी बनाया था मैं 80 83 में था शायद 
ये मरने से एक साल पहले तो एक्चुअली हमारी पोस्टिंग हाँ हम लोग पोस्टिंग थी सिक्योरिटी में थी हम और वीआईपी सिक्योरिटी में तो जब भी इंदिरा गांधी मैडम जाती थी उनके साथ हम लोग ड्यूटियाँ देते थे एज उनके साथ पी एस भी ड्यूटी पे जाते थे और जब वो घर पे पब्लिक से मिलती तब भी उनके साथ साथ रहते थे हम लोग तो ज़्यादातर चौदह अगस्त की रात को हमारे पास ऑफिस से मैसेज आया कि भाई आपको वहाँ पर रात रात को ही बुला लिया उन्होंने हमें मतलब रात के तीन चार बजे के भाई आप लोग को वहाँ पे ऑफिस में पहुँचना है सिक्योरिटी लाइन ऑफिस में और हमें बताया नहीं कि हमें क्या करना है लेकिन जब हम लोग सुबह पहुँचे तो हमसे ये कहा गया था कि भाई आप वाइट साड़ी पहन आना जब वहाँ पहुँचे सुबह को तो पता चला पंद्रह अगस्त की ड्यूटी के लिए हमें भेजा जा रहा है और हमें मैडम इंदिरा गांधी की तरह उनकी तरह ही हमें एक्शन करना है और गाड़ी में बैठना है मतलब उनका डमी बना के हमें और एक ले और ऑफिसर थी हमारी कुसुम उन दोनों को तो हमें उन्होंने बना के और उसमें गाड़ी में हमारे ड्यूटी पर ले गए जो जिसके बारे में मालूम नहीं था हम हमें बड़ा अजीब लगा कि भाई हमें पंद्रह अगस्त को और मैडम की जगह बना के भेजा जा रहा है तो कुछ खुशी भी थी कुछ डर भी था कि भाई क्यों भेजा जा रहा है वहाँ पर क्योंकि मैडम को खतरा था अभिवादन किया है स्वतंत्रता दिवस की इस वर्षगांठ पर आज दूरदर्शन के लिए एक विशेष गर्व की बात है कई कारण थे उसके सबसे पहले तो आज पहली बार इंसेट के माध्यम से रंगीन प्रसारण आप देख कर देखे इंजन के पास भी रंगीन सेट है और कुछ अन्य केंद्रों में थे दिल्ली के अलावा Now to the most noted, most mystifying illusion of the world, cutting a lady in half. Yeah, we reached the 15th August. We reached the Lal Kale. और एंट्री हुई हमारी वहाँ पर तो मेरी गाड़ी सबसे आगे थी तो जितने हमारे सीनियर ऑफिसर सीपी से लेके जितने भी आर्मी वाले सब बड़े बड़े ऑफिसर समझ रहे थे कि मैं हम बैठे हैं गाड़ी में सब ने हमें सलूट दिया और मुझे बड़ी हंसी भी आती रही कि बताओ हम हमारे इतने बड़े बड़े अफसर इतने सीनियर वो सारे समझ रहे हैं कि हम मैं इंदिरा जी हूँ और सारे सलूट कर रहे थे गाड़ी के लाल किले से आगे होती भी निकल गई लाल किले के अंदर रेंट हो गई अब जब प्रेस वालों ने देखा कि गाड़ी इनकी इधर क्यों चली गई और क्या चक्कर हुआ सारे प्रेस वाले हमारे पीछे पीछे वो भी वहाँ पहुँच गए क्या कहते हैं अंदर लाल किले के अंदर जब तो जब एंट्री हो गए वहाँ पे एंट्री गेट पर वहाँ पर हमें गाड़ी रोक ली उन्होंने सब प्रेस प्रेस वालों ने पूछने पर कौन है प्रेस प्रेस रिपोर्टर हैं कुछ टी आर्टिस्ट हैं कौन है बताओ सीनियर ऑफिसर भी लग रहे तो उन्होंने हमें चार तो से घेर लिया प्रेस वालों से बचाने के लिए और धक्का मुक्की शुरू हो गई हमारे दास साहब हुआ करते थे उस जमाने में और उन्होंने बेचारे में बड़े धक्का मुक्की करके हमें बचाने की कोशिश की तो हमारी साड़ी कपड़े भी मतलब साड़ी की फॉल लग गई फड़ गई थी साड़ी वाले हमारी साड़ी हमारी साड़ी Open your eyes. Open your eyes. Look at them. Smile. 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 बाद में 
मैं हमने बुलवाया कि भाई जो हमारे डमी बने थे हम उनके साथ फोटो वोटो खिंचवाना चाहते हैं उनको बुलाओ पर उस वक्त हमारे हालत ऐसी हो गई थी कपड़े वपड़े फट गए थे कि हमने सोचा शाम को जाएंगे फिर हमारी हिम्मत नहीं पड़ी मतलब जा नहीं पाए लेकिन उन्होंने हमें बुलाया था कि भाई हम उनसे मिलना चाहते हैं फोटो वोटो खिंचवाएँगे उनके साथ खैर उसके बाद गुजर गया उसके बाद पंद्रह अगस्त के ये पंद्रह अगस्त थी हमारी मैडम की आखिरी थी पंद्रह अगस्त उनकी ज़िंदगी की उसके बाद कुछ ही महीने बाद ये फिर एटी में उनका Okay, and uh, and my final claim uh, for tonight, I mobilize uh, via uh, sound, uh, echo, and uh, and failure. And I think this is also important because uh, after moving through uh, image, light, uh, memory, archive, erasure, um, the story of film will be incomplete uh, without addressing uh, the oral, right? Uh, and the chief difference between light and sound is that unlike light, which can travel in a in a vacuum, sound needs uh, material surfaces to move. Uh, and because this is the case, um, it changes in in texture, in intensity, um, as the material world around it uh, changes. Right. Um, so in many ways, uh, sound is more worldly uh, than light. Uh, it resists um, uh, transcendence. Right. Uh, so it's uh, it's decay. It's it's doubling, uh, splitting, uh, delay. Um, they're all linked to the fate of the material world. Um, uh, and you know, uh, I kind of tra I trained in in uh, film at uh, Jamia University, uh, you know, in New Delhi. Uh, and as part of our training, uh, we were required to shoot uh, some projects on uh, celluloid film. And the sound uh, for all the shooting that we were doing had to be recorded on a separate recorder, for example, like the Nagra machines, etc. Um, you know, but because uh, the visual and the audio were being recorded on on separate devices, uh, we use as all, all films do a physical clap sound or a, or a clapperboard, uh, which quickly generates a, a loud sound, and uh, and eventually it is this loud sound that helps sync um, the audio and the visual tracks when the files go uh, on the edit. Uh, and as I was writing down some thoughts for, for this talk today, um, uh, you know, this sound came back to me as a catastrophic sound um, in a kind of morbid parallel. You know, if you saw um, the footage of the police attack on Jamia students and the vandalizing of the Jamia library, uh, it is the swinging baton that kind of, uh, you know, hits books, tables, bodies, uh, which inaugurates um, uh, this recording uh, that was widely circulated. And yet, because, uh, you know, the material has been recorded on a CCTV camera, there is no sound. Uh, it's quiet. Um, and so if one had to do kind of an oral uh, portrait of catastrophe, uh, we realize that just like uh, pure light is catastrophic because it uh, digests and destroys everything in its path, pure sound uh, like that of the clapperboard uh, or pure tone, uh, you know, which is used in TV broadcasts or, or audiometry, if any of you have um, ever needed to uh, get your ears tested, uh, pure tones are played as a way of testing hearing uh, thresholds, right? Um, and, and this pure tone is a kind of sound uh, devoid of all sounds, but it's also the tightest uh, hearable fold, you know, almost like a, um, 
almost like a knot uh, uh, whose origins have been lost, right? Uh, so pure sound is all, uh, catastrophic. Um, you know, it's uh, this tone, this pure tone is the sound of, of nothing and everything at once, but it, it is what makes the conditions for hearing possible, right? I'm again returning to the kind of generative destruction, uh, uh, the catastrophe is a site of creativity. Uh, and another way in which I'm, uh, you know, kind of uh, interested in sound is, is how it uh, it's kind of uh, generated inside the mind uh, and produces a certain kind of uh, separation uh, from the world. Um, uh, in uh, you know, in, in filmmaker Iram, Iram Gufran's film, uh, there's something in the air uh, on which I had the wonderful opportunity of assisting her. There is a sequence where the uh, analyst asks the analyst son about her hallucinations, you know, and this is a way to kind of distinguish uh, a true hallucination uh, from a pseudo hallucination. Uh, and, and he asks her, do you hear these sounds in your ear, like you would hear traffic on the street? Uh, or do you hear them uh, in your mind, like we would hear an old song, right? Mm, and it's this quality of sound which clings almost to the world of its production that actually makes it a very provocative force. Um, so in a way, um, you know, uh, the line between reality uh, and its uh, shadow can also be imagined uh, just as a hearing threshold, uh, right? So the question then that I pose uh, for myself uh, as an artist is that can I push these thresholds, right? And when new thresholds will be produced, what uh, will the renewed or recalibrated codes of ethics and aesthetics look like? Right. Um, these are persistent questions uh, for me. Um, and uh, and actually, before I show you a short uh, kind of a sequence from another sequence from my work, which sort of uh, congeals around some of these questions and ideas. I want to read to you a, a short bit from uh, the imitable Dambuzo Marachera's House of Hunger, um, you know, who's often been described as somebody who uses words like bullets. Uh, and those of you who've read him uh, know that language is never the same after you've read Marajera and those who haven't, a, a gift awaits you. Um, so uh, this uh, short passage that I want to read to you, I feel, I, I feel kind of, you know, it pulls everything uh, from light, sound, uh, history, catastrophe um, that I've been somewhat inadequately trying to uh, capture through my, uh, talk and, and showing my work so far. Um, so I will just turn to Marajera and I would read, I'd like to read to you a short passage. Uh, so just one second, just pull it up. Okay. Uh, that night, all the lights I had known flashed through my mind. The pain was the sound of slivers of glass being methodically crushed in a steel vice by a fiend whose face was very like that of my old carpentry master who is now in a madhouse. The skin lightened dancer, she was burning, burning the madness out of me. The room had taken over my mind. My hunger had become the room. There was a thick darkness where I was going. It was a prison, it was the womb. It was blood clinging closely like a swamp in the grass matted lowlands of my life. It was a white's only sign on a lavatory. It was my teeth on edge, the bitter acid of it. It was the effigy swinging gently to and fro in the night of my mind. And the pain of it flared into flame, flickering like a match. For a moment, it lit up the room making the shadows of the naked dancer and me leap quickly across the ceiling and fuse into an embrace, leaping like ecstasy grown sad, a violence slowly translating into gentleness. But the match died out and history was the blackened twig of it. The fine grains of that burnt out insurrection were the stories of those black heroes among uh, whom my story was merely one more skin lightening pain. Is the pain of the mind greater than that of the body? The friends whose hurt looks have flung me back into living like this, little cubes of ice burning through my mind. You're burning your finger, 
Julia exclaimed. I threw the almost burnt out matchstick of history into the ashtray, unquote. Also, Marachera had once said, um, if you were a writer uh, for a specific uh, nation or race, then fuck you. I would just add artists, curators, and cultural writers, uh, workers to that list. Uh, so I'll stop there uh, with a request to show the final sequence, and then uh, we can take a break, and I'm open to questions and comments. Thank you. फॉर रॉयट्स के बाद जो हत्याएं सिखों की हुई है हमने तो वो सीन देखा है जिसे आदमी देख नहीं सकता देख ले तो सपने में भी महीनों डरेगा लाशें ऐसे पड़ी हुई थी सब्जी मंडी जहां पोस्टमार्टम होता है जैसे ईंटों के ढेर पड़े हों जैसे बोरियां पड़ी हों पेट फूल के इतने मोटे मोटे हो गए और लाश के ऊपर लाश पड़ी हुई सैकड़ों लाशें दिल्ली से आई हुई आदमी डर जाए देख नहीं सकता पहचान नहीं है खून में सना पड़ा है सारा सिर फूटे हुए हैं बाल खून में तरम तर है हमने तो वो सीन देखे ऐसा नहीं है कि जो मिनटो सेकंड में हो गया प्री प्लैंड नहीं था लेकिन बिल्कुल उसके बाद प्रोग्राम था कतई आम आदमी को लेना देना था लूट से और उन्हें एक मौका मिल गया ना चाहते हुए भी लोग जो है उसमें शामिल हुए सिर्फ लूट के लिए उन्होंने बेशक ना मारा हो किसी को लेकिन लूटा तो और ये सब उनके बी एस्ट पे हुआ तो ये बड़ी बहुत ही विभत्स सीन था आदमी देख नहीं सकता हम तो कई कई दिन हमें जाना पड़ा पोस्टमार्टम कराने के लिए आदमी सांस नहीं ले सकता था फरलांग कई के फरलांग तक एक फरलांग तक कच, उधर कचहरी तक बदबू आती थी तीस हजार कोट तक इतनी बुरी स्मेल लाशें सड़ गई थी आइडेंटिफाई नहीं हो पा रहे थे सड़ने का मकसद ही है कि आइडेंटिफाई नहीं हो पा रहे आइडेंटिफिकेशन में बड़ा टाइम लगा उनके बहुत बुरा समय था
Thank you so much, Palavi, for such an incredible talk. I, mean, I sort of have goosebumps, though. Um, do you guys want to take a five minute break and then we can uh, sort of start our discussion? Yeah. So, um, 706 uh, GST. Yeah. Okay. We'll see you all in a bit.
Hi, Pallavi, and welcome back, everyone. Um, I'm just sort of, there was a comment on uh, YouTube by Kaushik Bomek. He, he asks, um, why are Bengali magicians so intent on cutting up ladies into halves? <laughs> Which are my thoughts exactly. Um, well, Kaushik should know better. He's both a magician <laughs> and a Bengali, so. Um, so, Pallavi, thank you so much uh, for your talk. And, and I mean, the films you showed are, are incredibly beautiful and and haunting at the same time. I'm sort of trying to digest them still. Um, and I think it's great having you as sort of our penultimate public talk because you summarize the, th the main themes that we've explored uh, in throughout you know, these past few months, uh, um, well, a couple of months, um, particularly you know, how you summarize them into um, the main them uh, thematics being um, you know, this uh, relationship between catastrophe and light and, uh, and memory and, and sound. And um, I mean, I, I don't have any particular questions as such, but I, I, there were a couple of things that um, I, I like that sort of stood out to me. This notion that um, there's a transcendence to time and then um, sound is sort of a, of a more sort of material world. Um, so thinking about it in terms of the, like sort of the, the footage that you showed us, um, I, I thought maybe you'd want to sort of expand on that a bit. Um, which uh, footage, uh, Mona? Uh, so just the, the sort of um, the comparison between the, maybe the second and the third film, um, or rather the first and the, and the third. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, these are ongoing, uh, you know, explorations around, you know, my curiosities about time, about materiality, about uh, cinema itself. Um, and uh, to me, all of these, uh, encounter, the encounter is of interest to me. Uh, you know, it's not the event uh, that I rely on so much. Um, so I think that uh, if we follow the inherent material logic uh, of light or of sound, uh, it allows, it opens up something, it allows, a, it opens up a capacity to, uh, you know, sense and read at the same time, where there's no hierarch hierarchical relationship, uh, you know, uh, between uh, sort of uh, analysis and sensation and research and its utterance and aesthetic. Uh, so I think that uh, it uh, helps me to stay close to the materiality uh, of, of things that I'm encountering. And I like to encounter them and not necessarily cast them, uh, you know, uh, within, like I said, uh, you know, kind of historical, uh, predetermined historical framework. Um, so that would just be a provisional response. Uh, and I think the films, uh, you know, the, the intention and the intensity of the film speak, uh, for the, speaks for itself, you know, uh, in the way that I assemble images and disassemble them sometimes and, and cut into them, cut them. Um, like a Bengali magician, so. <laughs> That's yeah. fantastic. Um, Falguni, do you wanna go ahead and unmute yourself? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Pallavi, I don't, uh, like Mona said, I don't have uh, many questions, but I just have a couple of observations and uh, things I picked up in your talk, which I would love to hear more about. Uh, you know, I, I really um, was taken by uh, when you were presenting the, uh, the center with the gravitational waves and this idea that blindness can be something from which an image emerges. And I wondered if you could speak a little bit more about why you think blindness is a co-journeyer of catastrophe, because that's one of the things you said. And I'd, I'd, I'd want to know more about that. And a statement that also stood out to me in your presentation was, you know, you said, sometimes you think of doubling as a form of cutting in, in half. So if you could elaborate on that relationship, these are just the two things I'd love to know more about. Yeah, uh, so of course, I mean, uh, the provocation of these statements also comes from its poetics, uh, which I think uh, resists uh, uh, kind of uh, literal unpacking, but I will still try. Um, so I think uh, blindness, uh, first of all, uh, you know, has been a persistent again, um, a thing that I've, I've been thinking through. So the blind rabbit is literally called the blind rabbit and uh, deals a lot with blindness. Um, and, you know, usually in kind of um, uh, 
critical discourse or, uh, you know, and especially because my work is making images, you know, uh, blindness is, uh, can very easily be seen as a loss of capacity. Uh, you know, that it uh, hinders something from happening. Um, but I am now increasingly interested in, in what it actually allows for, right? So, uh, you know, there is this, of course, now very well-known thing where other senses get sharpened or more attuned to the world around you, uh, you know, when you lose one sense. Um, and uh, so what, you know, and, and how vision has been cast, you know, and the other thing is how vision has been cast in history, in theory, um, also in practice, uh, cinematic practice as something revelatory, right? And we now know through the various kinds of disappointments that we have lived through and the various kinds of betrayals, political and otherwise, that vision and transparency and vision and knowledge and vision and um, uh, revelation uh, are actually not very tenuous. They're not really, that, that's not a commonsensical connection as it were, right? So then if this connection has uh, been unable to sustain uh, the kind of life force that runs through us, the relationship between vision and revelation, then we have to look elsewhere. Then we have to uh, form other languages, right? Uh, and for me, um, uh, this gathering, your, the, the colloquium, the specific context of the colloquium, because it is uh, a gathering of people whose work it is to look at uh, images and to think about images, I thought that this was an interesting provocation to bring here that what if we thought of a blindness as something that unlocks a certain kind of capacity. So this blindness is a literal blindness sometimes, but it's also metaphorical blindness, right? So if I, if I take away the, the trans historical comfort of the archive from you, right? If I tell you that a fake archive was generated and then that fake archive was also extinguished, right? Um, then where does that leave you? Obviously in a state of blindness, the LIGO experiment is interesting because it's not looking into the, it's not even dealing with the spectrum. It's not even dealing with the electromagnetic spectrum, which is instantiated via vision, right? So it's just, it's looking for something else, right? And the way to look for something else first is like, not only the fact that we are looking or not looking, but what it, what is it that we are hoping to find? That question, um, uh, you know, is a question that spins, keeps spinning on its own axis. And as artists, as curators, we catch it in different degrees of, you know, uh, at different angles, uh, sometimes intentionally, sometimes when we are not even paying, you know, uh, close attention. Um, so I will, so for me, it's not, uh, blindness is not a loss of capacity. Blindness is a, a moment in the encounter that you have with the world. And, and it's a moment that everybody encounters. And in that encounter, do you get paralyzed and refuse to create or, or become overwhelmed by something that's larger than you? Or do you continue to weave uh, something, you know, uh, not uh, in spite of it, but because of it? Uh, so that was the first thing. And what was the second uh, question uh, that you asked? Uh, I, I, I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about uh, the statement you said, sometimes you think of doubling as a form of cutting in half. Yeah. Yes. So, I mean, see, in a most uh, simple kind of, uh, you know, a way is that uh, when uh, this kind of structure of power, right, when it tries to project itself as a kind of multiplied everywhere, we know now, you know, the hoardings everywhere, one face, you know, on our vaccination certificates, on the street and everywhere, right? Um, it is, yes, seemingly a kind of amplification of, uh, of power, but it's also an amplification of all the psychoses that are actually embedded in that power, right? All the nervousness that undergirds that power, all the, all the uh, fears that undergird that power. So it's also simultaneously generating the conditions of its own uh, rupture or its own implosion, right? And uh, as political actants, that's what we need to be attuned to, right? Otherwise, the entire story of, you know, action can just be, oh, my God, we're getting plummeted and we're getting crushed and, you know, there's no hope and there's nothing. But, but in those moments of amplification, in those moments of doubling, where it is the gap, it is the heart of the heart. Mm -hmm. You know, if we, if we locate the heart of the heart, 
then we can begin to think anew. Then we can begin to uh, rejuvenate ourselves and, and renew action and thought. Um, so I think it's that levitating heart of the heart that's somewhere between cutting and, um, uh, you know, doubling, I would say. Yeah, thank you. I hope I, I didn't uh, trouble you too much by ask by asking to put poetry into some kind of national. Oh, troubled, Falguni, I'm deeply troubled. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your comments. Thank you. Um, Kunal, do we have any questions on, on YouTube by any chance? Um, we don't have any more questions. Okay. Yeah. Michelle? Do you want to go ahead and unmute yourself? Hi, Pallavi. Um, I just have a curiosity about um, in the first and second um, film that we saw um, on, on the topic of sound, like the voices of the uh, who's narrating their um, either poetry or their memory. Um, and yeah, like the specific things I was curious about is that they seem to be speaking. Um, it, it like sounds like soliloquy, but it's hard to imagine that they're not prompted in some ways. And it's also like kind of, especially in the second film, uh, recalling a somewhat traumatic memory, but um, spoken in a quiet space, um, like the, the sound isn't, kind of recorded in a, also separately, um, yeah. And I, I guess I'm also kind of curious about your role in prompting that narration. So you mean whether I asked them, uh, are you trying to like, is the question more about like how I went about recording this material or? Um, yeah, how and also, um, uh, I I assume that the second, like the recalling of being the dummy of Indira Gandhi is somewhat of an interview um, with someone and... Yeah. Yeah. They are interviews and, um, but you know, one uh, thing that um, like I was also, uh, you know, uh, responding to uh, Falguni right now is that I'm not interested in um, uh, people in biographical details, right? I'm not interested in knowing um, where they were born, how did they do whatever. I'm not interested in the in the whys and the and the you know those kinds of questions. For me, the biographical basically imposes a very um, kind of inert uh, boundary around things, right? And then everything has to happen within that boundary. So, uh, and this is something I repeat a lot, but you know, I will repeat, I will say it again here, that all the people, all the protagonists in my films that pass through my films, I never say that they're characters. Uh, I don't like to think of them as characters because when you, the moment you say the word character, you you invoke the biographical, right? Because we know characters. We, we kind of know the world that they come from, whether it's in literature or cinema. And therefore we can sort of, you know, understand how they would react or, or what they would do. Uh, and this for me is the, um, is not exciting. Uh, so I like to think of uh, the uh, people in my films as hosts, you know, so if you hosted a party, you'd call some people over and you've created the premise for people meeting, but then their conversations would exceed your brief. They would exceed the conditions that you have set, right? So the protagonists in my films are a little bit like hosts. They create the conditions for you to meet things and ideas, and then um, these things take their own course. So the specific people that I went to uh, to kind of record and interview, I was very much thinking of them as uh, protagonists in an encounter, right? So I was not interested in um, their life or, uh, you know, trying to indict them or trying to get at the bottom of anything. It was about somebody, it was about somebody describing um, the conditions for that violence, right? What, what enabled the conditions for that violence to happen and what was the texture of what happened? Uh, and, uh, and therefore they recount it in that vein, right? Um, they are part of those stories, but not in a way that 
makes those stories about them. Uh, it's a story about a moment and that moment has to be, uh, and that moment, I put a cinematic pressure on that moment. Uh, I try to release the historical pressure and I kind of, uh, kind of reinstate it uh, with a kind of cinematic pressure. And I think that's what um, this form uh, attempts to do, uh, you know, the form that I'm kind of invested in and want to explore further. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but. Yeah, totally. Um, I think the host uh, position is really great. Uh, Palabi, I just wanted to, uh, there was something that Falguni had sort of picked up on and I thought it was incredibly interesting, this idea of um, cutting and doubling. You know, the I'm thinking doubling in terms of mirrors. Um, I don't know if Rohit's with us, but I'm thinking of in terms of his sort of his writing on the can. Um, and then this notion of the, the cutter, the incision as a sort of necessary break. Um, in our previous conversations on time and um, we're sort of thinking about, um, um, you know, creating a ne necessary break in the contemporary and then this dialectic between the past and the present that emerges. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not a particular question, but it, I, I, it's incredible. I think you're like I said, your, your talk sort of summarized everything that we've been discussing thus far. So it's kind of incredible. <laughs> um, but do you want to add to that? No, just a very simple thing that uh, I think this, um, the idea of cutting or incision is important because what, what it is, what is it that we're incising? We're also incising the relationship between the present and the contemporary. Mm -hmm. We're also incising the relationship between time and history. We're also incising the relationship between, um, you know, light and shadow. Um, so these are all incisions that actually then produce, uh, and each incision opens up a path. Right? It's not a laceration, it's not a wound, it's actually the release of something. So if an abscess has to be released or you know, if you have to uh, create a ventilation, if you have to open up a circulatory system, that's what this, these incisions are, uh, right? They're not incisions to be born as wounds or not incisions that, that cause, uh, you know, that deplete you of something. They actually uh, let air in, you know, uh, and uh, that uh, is, uh, the way in which I use uh, the word incision and very much uh, in line with what you mentioned, which is it's a resistance to telos, it's a resistance to uh, the burden of uh, casting time in a particular way. And I think the, the magic of cinema, why I love cinema, is that it's um, in its inception, it does that. It is, it is in, incisive in, in its very form. And I like to uh, use the possibilities of that form and the momentum of that form to my advantage as an artist. So, yeah. And you had stated at the beginning, uh, sort of in terms of your work, this idea of the transmission between the particular and the universal. And I'm, when I, after watching uh, the films you showed us, I'm reminded of Abbas Kirstami's uh, famous saying, in order to be universal, you need to be sort of rooted in your own culture. So I think uh, you're, uh, I, yeah, I, I'm very, I was deeply affected by your film. So thank you for showing us them. Um, Falguni had uh, one uh, comment, but she says it's a tangential question. Go ahead, Falguni. Hi, I, I just have one really unrelated question to this talk. So if somebody has something that's specifically related to it, maybe we can take that first and I can come at the end. No, I think, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Balavi, I just want, I, I mean, I just saw Rohini dipped out just and left a message in the chat box. I was sort of uh, inspired to ask you if you could speak a little bit about uh, Splice and uh, your decision to start that together with Rohini and what led you, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in artists slash curators and people who dabble between the two. And I don't, I don't think there are binaries. Uh, we're all a little bit of both, but I'm interested in that formal move that you've made uh, from, from a practicing visual artist to also a member of a 
curatorial duo. So if you could speak a bit about that, uh, your impulse to do it, how you think your practice, you know, sort of carries over into that. I think that our group will benefit from it. Okay, sure. Thanks, Valdini, for asking that. I think um, for uh, Rohini and I, uh, strange to call her Rohini, I always call her Ro, but for, for Ro and I, it's, um, uh, we, we try to uh, encapsulate some of the uh, impulses behind Splice in the kind of little text that we put out when we sort of announced our union to the world. Um, but it was, um, it was more, it's basically also a coefficient of um, friendship, um, but friendship as a, again, as a kind of uh, zone of uh, creativity, of thought, of, um, uh, you know, nurturing uh, uh, ideas, and also um, how do you produce an utterance, which is an affectionate utterance, which is also a critical utterance, which is also something um, that produces a stake in the world and in each other's work and practice, um, uh, continuously right uh, and to us uh, the world of uh, art images making thinking again like i said the curatorial is uh, uh, exciting because it's a mode of producing attention right uh, very much like uh, making art right and and so but each also has its own specific demands and in particular grammar so uh, i think um, the decision very much came from uh, you know uh, after the pandemic and after uh, you know witnessing and of course our uh, friendship is uh, older than that but you know the pandemic made us aware that there is the need to produce a, a certain kind of um, force uh, uh, in uh, artistic uh, endeavors and, 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 and the world as it were in the art world to which actually takes uh, the possibilities of friendship seriously uh, as a critical uh, site. Um, and because, you know, uh, we were carried by friendships through that really dark time, right? Um, and, uh, it's, um, and it's to extend that uh, now uh, in almost as if, you know, in this post-apocalyptic scenario, it's to extend that into a zone of creation um, and, and re-articulating the world together. Uh, so, uh, and I, th there is no conflict that we sense at all with our individual uh, practices. In fact, I think if anything, it uh, gives us uh, more uh, to think about, more to chew on, more to debate um, and disagree about and also come together around. So um, it's, uh, it's been uh, wonderful uh, to be able to find a form uh, that is, uh, um, I think also maybe then hopefully asking questions of um, the way art markets operate, the way, uh, you know, a certain kind of atomized uh, existence, which is a very market driven existence of the artist is always kind of in conflict with one's peers is created. So there's also this is and, a, a, and we imagine splice to be like kind of a, a you know, this address is, is not a, something that removes us as a duo from the world, but actually you know, more tightly sort of creates tighter uh, enmeshments and, and weaves across, you know, and, and channel other friendships and, and other ideas and other, other worlds, as it were. So it's an expansion. We see it very much as an expansion. We see it very much as a strengthening of certain things and uh, nourishment. Uh, it comes from a space of nourishment, affection, and friendship. Great. Thank you. Uh, Kunal, any questions on YouTube? We actually do have a couple of questions. We do, okay, fantastic. Yeah, so Ravi Sankar asks, what if the body is cut into, maybe put this on the chat, just give me a second. He asks, what if the body is cut into several parts and some parts of the body become light and some parts of the body become sound or a mixture of both? Then what is transcendent? 
transcendence and material. Mm, I don't know how to answer that question. I hope uh, Ravi is talking about uh, not a human body and uh, and a plant body or you know some kind of other body, but. Mm, I mean, I guess uh, the question of like, I think throughout my talk, I was trying to um, uh, kind of uh, problematize uh, transcendence uh, through materiality, but also show possibilities of other kinds of, uh, you know, non-historical ideas of transcendence. Um, and, uh, and again, like I said, to create a relay between the particular and the universal. So. I think the body is a good uh, test case uh, for that. It's a good testing ground uh, for those things to happen. And um, yeah, I, I, all I can say is it's a very cinematic question, which is very visual, but um, I don't know what would happen. Uh, I guess we find out, you know, if we try it. So um, unless anyone has any sort of final thoughts, questions, um, please do share. Um, oh, and uh, I think uh, Ravi is writing a follow-up on YouTube, um, but it's still difficult to really get the question. He mentions film, body, celluloid. Does that help? Um, yeah, I mean, it just I think that this is um, uh, this is a scenario that will have to play itself out uh, through um, uh, these sites that you indicated in your question. Um, I haven't yet uh, tried this to see what happens to this part of the celluloid or, or filming body, but um, but yeah, I appreciate the question. I think it's very visual and it's, uh, I'll think about it. I'll think about what could happen. I think Mona, maybe you could give it a few more seconds because YouTube- Sure, of course, yeah, there's a delay. There's a lag and then we can wrap up maybe. Oh, and uh, Pallavi, maybe you can speak to us about um, uh, your, well, the, the Hungry for Time, the Rux show at the uh, um, Academy of Fine Arts at v in, in Vienna. Um, I, I, I briefly spoke to Rohini about it at some point, and um, this idea of uh, the glass house really stood out, and, and uh, I, I, I thought your sort of, uh, your curation was quite beautiful. Um, yeah, we had a blast doing it. Um, yeah, it's an incredible uh, invitation uh, from, of course, uh, from Rux, uh, who, uh, who have curated this exhibition called Hungry for Time. And the idea was to work with the collection of the, of the academy. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, and there were scenes provisionally labeled as scenes that were kind of, uh, we were invited to respond to and um, a splice responded to a scene on flowers. Uh, and we had to sort of, you know, within uh, this particular way in which uh, a certain kind of academic painting emerging from a certain part of the world, um, deals with flowers or portrait flowers. Uh, we wanted to kind of rearrange or dearrange the story of flowers. So, you know, a flower arrangement became a flower derangement. Um, and uh, the idea was uh, to, uh, and you know, there were all of these incredible stories where, um, you know, women, for example, who were tried as witches uh, in Europe, uh, along with them, flowers were also put on trial. Uh, because they were thought to be exercising uh, this witchcraft using flowers. So the rose and the fennel and, you know, all of these criminal flowers, basically. Um, so, um, and, you know, once we started uh, finding this out, so we, we were arranging or deranging our own bouquet of, of impulses or stories. 
And of course, the story of the glass house is quite integral to colonialism and mm -hmm. uh, the story of the empire. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, there's uh, a glass house comes about, for example, when uh, the Roman emperor Tiberius, you know, he wants to eat cucumbers yeah. all year. And so uh, the time has to be rigged uh, and heat has to be rigged in order for cucumbers to grow through winter. So that's how that's how a glass house is formed. So, you know, we say at some point, you know, that the empire needed cucumbers and cucumbers needed time. And so <laughs> hungry for time you know and um, and so uh, we imagine this glass house but then we make it explode um, uh, you know or under the it's kind of a historical confusion is produced so it, it explodes and it's in the explosion it's in this exploded glass house that we then bring in different materials from the academy's collection uh, as as ways to clog it uh, as opposed to be kind of these beautiful ornate objects. And then of course, there's this absolutely incredible uh, video, uh, which is kind of this creepy decay, you know, something's decaying and there's insects coming and the sounds coming. And uh, so, yeah, basically we, um, we take you to, into the floral, into a florocracy, but that florocracy is not just um, fragrant and pleasant. It, it comes with a lot of other stuff. Uh, so yeah, that's in short, that's, uh, uh, that's the work in Vienna. Yeah, no, that's incredibly fascinating. Um, I, I was telling Rohini, uh, it's funny how something as sort of benign as a, a glass house could be, you know, utilized for such dangerous means in, you know, in the case of empire. And uh, I recall the, there was this Wardian case um, at the Chelsea Physic Garden, I think, which played a huge role in, in the opium wars. So <laughs> that's a whole, I'll, I'll send you something, uh, some reading yeah. on that, yeah. Um, so on that note, um, shall we uh, close our remarks? Yeah, we can wrap, okay. Uh, well, thank you again, Pallavi, for an incredible talk. And I mean, there's so much to digest. Uh, I, you summarize everything so beautifully. Um, and thank you again for showing us your work. And uh, for those of you who are interested, the second half of Splice um, is uh, she, Rohini Devasher is going to uh, be giving us a talk on the 7th of December, I believe. So uh, please stay tuned for that. And uh, thank you all for joining us and, and especially thank you to Pallavi. Um, and uh, we'll see you guys next week then. Thanks for having yeah. me. Thank you. Bye-bye.